Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the risk-return trade-off. In the last lecture, we explored how difficult it is to estimate how easily a country can build nuclear weapons and how willing they are to do so. This lecture begins analyzing how that affects bargaining patterns. To begin, let's review the general logic of nuclear negotiations. The opponent thinks about what would happen in a world where a potential proliferator had a fully realized nuclear weapon, and it calculates the number of concessions that it would have to give to convince the proliferator not to use those nuclear weapons. Here, we're representing that amount with a dashed line. Pre-proliferation, the opponent offers concessions commensurate with that eventual outcome to the potential proliferator. It doesn't offer the full amount, though, because by agreeing to a deal, the potential proliferator doesn't have to pay the cost of nuclear weapons, and the opponent can extract that amount for itself. Here, the potential proliferator has low costs, so the opponent can't get too much more. It can get something, but not a lot. In contrast, imagine that the potential proliferator has high costs to develop nuclear weapons. Now the opponent can extract a lot more for itself, and offer a worse deal to the potential proliferator. That's because the potential proliferator looks at the high price tag to develop nuclear weapons and is more reticent to begin construction. That weakens the potential proliferator's bargaining power and thereby allows the opponent to keep more for itself. Recalling the central lesson from the previous lecture, the opponent might have a hard time distinguishing between a low-cost and a high-cost type of potential proliferator. That's because the opponent might not have a perfect idea of what the potential proliferator's domestic nuclear industry looks like and how competent it is, or how politicians within the potential proliferator feel about developing nuclear weapons more broadly. Given this uncertainty, the opponent faces what's known in bargaining theory as a risk-return trade-off. Broadly speaking, the more the opponent offers, the more likely the potential proliferator is to accept the offer. To visualize why, imagine that the opponent offers a level of concessions commensurate with a low-cost ability to develop nuclear weapons. This is a generous concession to the potential proliferator. And clearly a potential proliferator with low costs is willing to accept it by virtue of the fact that the opponent is designing these sorts of concessions for a low-cost potential proliferator. Of course, a potential proliferator with high costs is willing to accept that amount as well. That's because the potential proliferator with high costs would have accepted a lot smaller of an amount, so it's going to be quite excited to be getting this larger amount in negotiations. But therein lies the rub. The more that the opponent offers, the less the opponent keeps conditional on an agreement. If a potential proliferator actually has high costs, then the opponent could have extracted a lot more for itself. So it's somewhat happy that at least it's getting a deal done, but it's dissatisfied insofar as the opponent, in retrospect, could have taken a lot more for itself and still gotten a deal done with such a high cost type of potential proliferator. As a result, the opponent has to balance the risk versus the return when formulating its optimal demand. Is it worth making a small offer to the potential proliferator to extract a lot more for yourself, knowing that it may backfire and you may end up in a situation where the potential proliferator actually had low costs and you suffer the consequences of nuclear proliferation? Or do you wanna play things safe, make a generous offer, a conservative demand, and guarantee acceptance from both lower and higher cost types of potential proliferators. One of the determinants of the optimal demand within the risk-return trade-off is what the opponent thinks that the potential proliferator is likely to be. For example, imagine that the opponent believes that the potential proliferator 99% of the time is going to be having low costs, and only 1% of the time would have high costs. It makes sense to play things safe here. If the opponent gets aggressive and demands more for itself and leaves less for the potential proliferator, 
then 99% of the time, the potential proliferator will reject such a demand, leaving to the negative consequences of nuclear proliferation. The opponent doesn't want that, and it's not worth betting on the 1% of the time that it's going to work, and the opponent will be able to capture more for itself under that extremely unlikely circumstance. In contrast, imagine that the opponent is fairly certain that the potential proliferator has high costs. It may be only 1% of the time the potential proliferator actually has low costs. Then it makes sense to issue a large demand. 99% of the time, it will pay off, and the opponent will get a great deal for itself. It is true that this bargaining strategy could end up backfiring. 1% of the time, the potential proliferator actually has low costs, and will see this large demand by the opponent and find it to be unacceptable. Nuclear proliferation will result, and in retrospect, the opponent will regret having made this large demand for itself. However, at the time of formulating the demand, the opponent is not operating with complete information. And given that uncertainty, and the fact that 99% of the time the large demand will pay off, it is worth taking a risk in expectation. Another determinant of the opponent's bargaining strategy is how it feels about the negative consequences of nuclear proliferation. If, for example, it is very scared about the environmental problems that come along with nuclear tests, then it will be more inclined to make small demands and generous offers to the potential proliferator. Thinking about this a little bit more substantively, the risk-return trade-off is helpful in understanding why Pakistan developed nuclear weapons. From the start, Pakistan was having a hard time convincing others that they were serious about doing this sort of thing. There's a famous quote from Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who at the time was the foreign minister of Pakistan, but would later become the chief executive, about how Pakistan was willing to eat grass if necessary to develop a nuclear weapon. Unfortunately, talk is cheap. A high-cost type of potential proliferator has every incentive to convince its opponent that it actually has low costs. That's because if a high-cost type is not believed, it's going to receive a relatively poor offer for itself. In contrast, if it can convince others that it truly has low costs, then the concessions will be free-flowing, and the potential proliferator will be much better off. In turn, bold proclamations like the promise to eat grass are not immediately credible. There was a similar problem with reading India's desire to acquire a nuclear weapon. The U.S. knew that India had the technical capacity to proliferate, but they misread Indira Gandhi's intentions and were very surprised when the 1974 Smiling Buddha test occurred. They didn't think it would be happening that year. In any case, the key takeaway here is that uncertainty can lead to bargaining breakdown. In particular, the recipe for disaster is that the opponent thinks that the potential proliferator has a high cost to develop nuclear weapons or a low willingness to do so, and is wrong in its assessment. That means that the opponent offers insufficient concessions to the potential proliferator. That potential proliferator that's willing and has low cost to develop nuclear weapons rejects the demand and builds a nuclear weapon instead. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.